Hello everyone, I'm Scott Carbon Ogden. I'm a product manager at Google, based in London and working on the Android Games team. One of the big projects that our team is working on is the Android Performance Tuner. Today, I'll be taking you through some of the key considerations when adopting the Android Performance Tuner, APT for short, and be walking you through how to interpret the data that you get back from APT. Just to refresh your memory, or for those of you who perhaps haven't heard of APT previously, Android Performance Tuner enables you to deliver the best possible experience to each of your users. It does this by helping you measure and optimize frame rate stability and graphical fidelity across Android devices at scale. It helps you to identify performance issues in your game or app, and also highlights opportunities to improve your graphical fidelity. It has impact metrics to help you prioritize, and issues are categorized in a way to help you take action. It's now ready for integration into your game, and works with almost any C or C++ game. If you use Unity 2017.4, it's even easier with our Unity plugin. Although for advanced information, like GPU time, you'll need Unity 2019.3.12 or newer. For those of you on the Unreal Engine, you'll need our frame pacing API, which is integrated as standard from Unreal 4.25 onwards. So today we're going to cover how to configure the Android Performance Tuner for your game, and then we'll go through an example of how to interpret the results from the Android Performance Tuner. So frame time is at the core of the Android Performance Tuner. It's the variable that you're trying to optimize so that your game is both fun and engaging, while still looking as visually appealing as possible. Frame time is the time that it takes to render one frame of the scene. It's the inverse of the frame rate. So a frame rate of 10 frames per second requires a frame time of 0.1 seconds or 100 milliseconds. When frame times increase, the frame rates drop and the game becomes frustrating and unplayable. This is shown in this example. On the left, we have an animation at 10 frames per second and on the right is a smooth 60 frames per second. Let's dive a little deeper now into how this might be defined and measured. So what should we choose to define as frame time? Should it be from when a frame is displayed on screen until the next is displayed? Should it be from when the CPU starts rendering the first frame until it starts rendering the next? Well, you have three options of Android Performance Tuner. Firstly, you can choose to use the frame times from the Android Frame Pacing API. Secondly, if you have your own frame pacing library, you can use its output to measure frame times. And lastly, for older versions of Unity, the plugin will use Unity ticks. First, let's look at using the Android Frame Pacing API, or Swappy as it's sometimes known, to provide measurements for each frame. The Frame Pacing API provides the raw amount of CPU and GPU time spent working on each frame, so that you can see if you're a CPU or GPU bound. It'll also help you know how much headroom you have, rather than just seeing the paced frame time. To get all these details though, you'll need version 1.3 of the Frame Pacing API, which is integrated into Unity 2019.3.12, Unreal 4.25, or available for standalone download. If you choose to use your own frame pacing, you'll want to provide CPU and GPU times from your frame pacing system, so that you can get these raw times and see what's actually consumed rather than just the paced time. If you're using an older version of Unity, APT will use Unity ticks. This is a signal from Unity near the start of each frame, it only looks at the time between the rendering of frames on the CPU, so you won't get a breakdown of CPU versus GPU times. And if your frames are paced so that they render at regular intervals, you'll only get that paced time. Annotations provide you with a way of marking up parts of your game so that you can see how these parts affect frame times. Loading is the most common annotation. We provide a special loading annotation that lets you exclude loading screens from your overall frame time metrics, since these won't be representative of gameplay. Similarly, you should use annotations to differentiate any menus in the game from the actual gameplay, so you can focus your attention on where it really matters. You'll still be able to look at the metrics for frame time on the menus, but you'll be able to slice them out from the actual gameplay. We recommend that you use different annotations for each game level. There's a feature in our Unity plugin to do this automatically if you use Unity scenes. And this way you can see if there are some levels that perform slower than others, and take the appropriate action, such as decluttering the level. If there are elements in your game which you think might have a significantly negative impact on frame rate, you can annotate these as well. 
you might choose to annotate a new character with a particularly complex mesh, a success screen with many particle effects. You can later slice out just these parts of the game to see if they really are causing an issue or not. Lastly, you might want to annotate some signals that will help you identify the causes of issues. You could add annotations for poor network connections, for sessions that have a failed device anti-abuse check, or for sessions where the device has overheated. Quality levels are a collection of fidelity parameters that make a meaningful group. You might think of them as low, medium, high quality, with low having the lowest quality textures and many effects turned off, and high having everything turned on and the finest textures. In APT, you assign each quality level a number rather than a name so that they're clearly ordered, and you can have as many of these quality levels as you'd like. Here you can see an example where we have a higher quality level on the left with reflections and extra vegetation, and a faster yet lower fidelity version on the right. The differences can be subtle, just some extra reflections, a few more props, but they can have a big effect on frame rates. For most games, you will likely only want a few of these levels to balance the testing overheads with the broad range of device capabilities. Once you have your list of quality levels, you will need to set one on each device and let APT know which quality level this device is using. You might have dozens of fidelity parameters, and so by grouping them into meaningful quality levels, it's much easier for you to later interpret the results coming back, and to consider which settings different devices should have. Whereas quality levels are coarse overall bands, fidelity parameters are the fine-grained attributes that go together to make a quality level. Some of these, like mesh quality or texture bitrate, might affect other metrics as well, such as memory or loading time, whereas some like shadows and particle effects might largely affect frame rate. As the developer of your game, you're in the best position to know what levers are available to your game to affect performance without impacting gameplay. But here are some ideas to provide some inspiration. You might consider mesh fidelity, effects like reflections and shadows, extra props in the scene that don't affect gameplay, optional particle effects, and most importantly, texture quality. Texture quality can be a really impactful fidelity parameter. Here you can see the same ASTC texture encoded with three different block sizes. The lower the block size, the faster the frame time, the lower the memory consumption, and the quicker the load time. This can be very important for low-end devices. You can barely notice the quality difference, but these more heavily compressed assets take up less than one-third of the size. Now that your device has been assigned a quality level with a set of fidelity parameters and is recording annotated frame times, it's time to think about uploading that data. To save your users memory and bandwidth, instead of recording every single frame, we group them together into buckets and upload the whole histogram of buckets together at regular intervals. You can configure these buckets if you'd like, but the defaults are recommended for most games. The data is uploaded to play servers and then will be collated and made available in Play Console within a few hours. The simplest way to configure the upload is to set an upload interval. With this, you can set a time, say every 10 minutes, after which the data will be uploaded. During development, you might want to make this number smaller so that you can validate the output more quickly. In production, you might want to upload less frequently so that your users use less bandwidth. You should also consider flushing the remaining data when the game gets backgrounded or is closed. It might be that for some users, the frame rate gets so bad that they quit the game. For those users, catching the final few seconds would be particularly useful for uncovering the issue and improving retention. Before I move on to analyzing the data, I wanted to quickly make you aware of some common issues so that you don't get stuck. Sometimes, if you've just integrated and you go into the dashboard, you'll get an error message saying not enough data, or you might only see a few data points. Don't worry, this might not be an issue. It might just be that you don't have enough data points to get over our privacy thresholds. Just wait a few more days and make sure that the display is set to show seven days worth of data. If you release to an internal test track, there won't be a privacy threshold and you should see the data straight away. If you release on any of the other test tracks, you might not have enough users to cross the privacy threshold until you do a full launch. It's really worthwhile to set up both annotations and quality levels in your first launch. Otherwise, it can be hard to tease apart and analyze the data. We'll see more on this in the interpretation section. Lastly, if you receive a 400 or 403 error, 
as you integrate the performance tuner, there's probably an issue with your API key. Go back to the Cloud Console and check all your settings. Don't forget, you can use the included validation tool to check that all the right data is being uploaded. Now that we've talked through the configuration, let's go for an example of interpreting the data to see what it looks like. The first step you should take with APT after integrating is to get a lay of the land. Open up Android Vitals in the New Play Console and look for Performance, then Insights in the side menu. When you do start to see some data, the first thing you want to look at is how your frame time is compared to your target. You can set the frame time target through the screen as well. 30, 60, 120 FPS, whatever you think is a realistic and optimal target for your game. Games with fast, frequent motion should target higher frame rates. To some extent, it's up to you and your team how you want to interpret these statistics. For your game, is 1% of frames running slow bad? Or is 10%? I think we can all agree that 90% of frames being slow is unideal. Research in this area shows that user retention starts to drop around the 10% mark, but there may be undesirable outcomes before that point. You can also use this high-level overview to decide where to focus. Within the chart, you can see impact. This is the percentage of all slow frames that are attributable to a certain problem. If you see that devices are the main impact on slow frames, it means that your game is running reasonably consistently, but some devices are running slow. This might be an indication that some devices are running on the wrong quality level for their capabilities. You can see in this case, it's devices on quality level 5, the highest quality level, that are underperforming. Of the 17 devices at quality level 5, 11 are underperforming. So you should consider changing the quality level of those devices, or even splitting quality level 5 into two quality levels to better cater to these two groups of devices. If you see that annotations are the main impact on slow frames, then it might be that your game runs reasonably consistently on most devices, but there are a few levels or situations where the game runs more slowly. You might want to go and reassess those parts of the game. Sometimes there'll be situations where the slow part of the game is running on a slow device, and so it'll count in both buckets. This means that the impact from device model issues and annotation issues might add up to be even greater than 100%. This is what you can see in the example. We can also see that this particular object, character protagonist, is present where most of the slow frames are happening. But they're primarily only affecting three of the five quality levels. You'll need to dig into this more on the annotation screen to see which quality levels are affected. It could be that this annotation uh, uses some effect heavily that is only found on higher quality levels. Conversely, it could be that just the low-end devices struggle with this level of detail and need a simpler mesh or texture. We'll talk more about the annotation screen shortly. The next section of the Android Performance Tuner is where we visualize the performance of sessions in your game. Each dot corresponds to a device. The bigger the dot, the more sessions ran on that device in the time period. The x-axis is how long it took to create each frame, and the y-axis is the quality level that device was on. You can see this orange line here at the target frame time. In this example, it's 33 milliseconds, or 30 FPS. It's a lot of information to take in, but this graph can be very powerful. Seeing devices in this space, just to the left of the orange bar, is good. It means these devices are hitting their target, but there's not a lot of wiggle room. They're at the right level. These devices down here on the bottom right are missing the targets at even the lowest quality level. With these devices, you have three options. Ignore them, and this isn't great because you'll likely get bad ratings from these users. You could exclude the devices, but that isn't great either because it means fewer users. Or lastly, you could try to make a whole new quality level with even lower fidelity parameters, half the texture quality, blockier meshes, fewer effects, and so on. These devices over here on the far left, these are massively overperforming. Here they're rendering frames at maybe 10 milliseconds. These devices could still produce fast frames at higher quality levels, so you should consider moving them up. If we had some here at the very top left, it would suggest that you have room for even higher quality levels with finer textures and more effects. There's also an equivalent graph for annotations, so you can see how your annotations stack up compared to one another. With the annotation view, you can also see which annotations have the largest portion of slow frames. 
You can skip over annotations, such as loading or menus, and just focus in on the gameplay bits, as this is where frame time matters the most. If you're finding a few scene or object annotations have a high percentage of slow frames, these are the bits of the game which you should discuss with your design team. Maybe the game level is too complex. Maybe the objects should be simplified in some way. You might have also added some annotations in here to do with temperature. If the game frequently performs poorly because the device is running hot, you might want to think about how you could reduce your thermal loads. Perhaps you put an annotation in to indicate that you're doing background loading during gameplay. If this is the case, a large percentage of slow frames here would show you that you're impacting gameplay and should consider if you're better off to do more loading upfront. Back in the Devices tab, if you click on one of the quality levels, you'll be taken to the device list. Here you can see how various SOCs and devices perform with your game. Beneath the SOCs, you can see devices. You can see how popular they are with the number of affected sessions. You can see their percentage of slow frames, and you can see their 90th percentile GPU and frame times. If you're looking to improve frame rate, what I would recommend that you do here is filter for egregiously bad frame times for example, 40 to 60 milliseconds, and then sort by the number of the affected sessions. You might just find that you have one or two devices that perform very badly, but are very popular. You can then go acquire these devices and use a profiling tool to find the issue. If there are a range of devices that are problematic, you might want to download the list of device models here. This produces a CSV of the problem devices, which you can then use to go and adjust the quality level of those devices. If you're already at the lowest level, you can look at the GPU time and frame time to decide if you're GPU bound or CPU bound. That might help you think of some ideas for new quality levels. Is it more that you need to simplify the simulation step, or are there some shaders that you should simplify? You could also consider switching to a more flexible texture compression format, such as ASTC. With ASTC, you can specify the block size, and so it's easy to create a new set of lower fidelity, faster assets. Once you've fixed the badly underperforming devices, you might want to look at where there's headroom. You could filter for devices rendering in 1 to 20 milliseconds. You might find that there's some new devices in there that your QA team hasn't yet picked up and moved to a higher quality bucket. You can do a similar CSV export and then update all of your overperforming devices. If you find that your overperforming devices are at the highest quality level, you could consider producing even higher quality assets or turning on even fancier features for some of these devices. So, to recap what we've talked about today, we discussed how we define frame time and the three different approaches to providing data to Android Performance Tuner. We talked about annotations and gave some examples of what you might like to annotate. We touched on quality levels and how you might group fidelity parameters. We discussed your options for upload intervals. We looked at some common issues in the integration process. And lastly, we walked through an interpretation of the data. I really hope that you found this overview useful. We think that we've made Android Performance Tuner relevant to almost any Android game, but especially relevant to games where frame rates are important. If you're interested in finding out more, or downloading and integrating the Android Performance Tuner, then check out the link in the description below. Thank you so much for your time today, and I hope that you're able to improve your game's performance using Android Performance Tuner.